The official teaching on Philippians will be done today, and then next week we have what we believe is going to be a phenomenal service. And so we're asking you that that will be the official, official, official close of Philippians, uh, but we think we have something pretty special for you next week, so I'm just trying to get you to come back, so please do that, all right? Hey, if you um, have your YouVersion app, uh, we want you to uh, get that open. By the way, if you go down to events, find Cedars Church. All the verses are already there for you. By the way, uh, we believe the YouVersion app is going to become really important in our next series. So if you have not uh, downloaded that app, we encourage you to look at it, get used to it. Uh, when we do our next series after Easter, we'll be uh, jumping into and using YouVersion in a more powerful way. Hey, and I just want to say this to you. I know that we have not announced this enough, but hey, Cedars First Steps class, it is next Sunday. Uh, we have a couple people signed up, but there are many new faces, and you need to come get a free lunch on us, and we need to tell you about how we became Cedars and what we're about and where we see God going. So it is after second service. You just have to go online to the registration. If you have the app, the Church uh, Center app, you can go there and actually register for that. It's free. Just let us know. We want to know how much food to get for you, and uh, it's going to be upstairs. But again, we want you to come. If you are new and you want to know it's about first steps is the best thing that you you could be a part of. All right. How many of you woke up this morning and said, please let him talk about money. Please let him talk about money. Please let him talk about money. How many of you guys woke up that way? Ready? Just, yes, yes, yes. The best topic in all of the kingdom. Let's talk about money. Uh-huh. I'm telling you right now, there are so many other things you would rather have me talk about than money. But we're going to talk about money. And the reason why, one of the things I love about going through a book is I don't get to choose. It is what it is, folks. Uh, it is the passage that we have today to finish up this book. And, and what's interesting is, is it's probably not what you think. I've heard pastors say they hate talking about money. I don't. I don't. I think it's one of the things that honestly, if we are truly honest with ourselves... Is one of the areas that we struggle with the most, but it's also the area in which we could see the most of God working, but we don't let him. It is the area where you can see God be faithful, but we don't step into it. And so because of that, I want to challenge people to not be afraid of this. I want to challenge people to step into what is being said here, and then in the process, look at themselves. Now, before I go any farther... One of the things I don't want to do is take things out of context. In this whole book, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. And it's very easy for pastors to take a context of him writing to a specific church, strip it out and make it about you. So hopefully I will not do that today. I will make sure that we keep it in context. But there are some rules in here that I think would be good for you to listen to and to understand and to see what is being said as we jump in to this passage. Again, folks, I will tell you, in a place that um, is so expensive to live and, and costs and everything else, and what do we do about money, and yet I think it's important that we talk about this this way. So let's open up our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, and we are going to begin. I rejoiced in the Lord. Remember, the word joy is throughout all this book. You really can't get that far without it coming up. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but yet you had no opportunity. So what has happened is, is that they have blessed uh, Paul again in an offering. And by the way, there was a season in which they wanted to give, but had no place or way to give. When Paul is arrested, if you look in the book of Acts, when Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, he is stuck where he believes any day he's going to Caesar, any day he's going to Caesar. But Festus, in hoping that, that Paul would give him a bribe, kept him two years. When I went to Israel, I got to be in the area where they believed this is where Paul would have been kept. This is the place he would have taken off of when he finally was left. But for two years, he's hanging out. So it's kind of like they didn't know to send money to him because he could have just taken off at any time. And he's finally gotten to where he's supposed to go. And they have said, hey, we want to support you again. And indeed, you were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So in this, we get verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. 
Wow, contentment. Man, one of the things we struggle with. Let's just be honest, folks. Paul is saying, look, I've learned how to be content. And one of the things that we have is, is we still live by this rule that is, I will be happy when. You guys know that rule? When you are young, I'll be happy when I graduate high school. I'll be happy when I get to college. I'll be happy when I graduate college. I'll be happy when I meet that person. I'll be happy when we have our first kid. I'll be happy when I have my first house. We just play this game. And the idea is we just, in our brains, think that whatever this next thing is going to be, that's going to be it. That's what's going to bring me my contentment. And I say the illustration over and over again, and then next year they come out with a new model of a new car, and then you realize you're not content anymore. You are happy... Until they put flares on the side. You go, ooh, now I need the flares. And it's a perfect example of what happens with us is that if we got something and we were content, there's only one thing, honestly, that I feel like I've been content with, and that's been like my wallet that I just, like, I'm happy with it. It works, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just, it's brown. I have my bag. It's brown. It holds my, I'm happy. You understand what I'm saying? Ladies, aren't you just happy with that one purse you have? Aren't you just happy with that? (laughs) Oh, did I hit a nerve? I'm sorry. (laughs) Guys, one wallet, one belt, one pair of shoes, cha-ching, right? So in that, this idea of it is, is that what do we do with contentment? And here's Paul, and he's saying this, for not that I'm speaking of being in need. He goes, look, I'm not trying to throw my needs out at you. I'm not trying to be, look, look, I need, I need, I need, I need. Not that I'm speaking of need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Here's what's interesting. What, notice the key word. I have what? Learned. Contentment is a learned process. It is a learned process of understanding that whatever we think is going to be the thing that will give us what we think we're going, it's going to give us is that it won't. And you start to realize what really is of value, what really is of importance can I live in a box? Jody thinks that I'd be fine in a cardboard box. Chances are she's right. Because the fact is, is like, what are we looking for? What's that thing it's going to have? Only if it, you know, what would it be? And yet he just goes, no, I've learned. Contentment's not coming from outside. Contentment's not coming from the things I can get. Yes, they can be nice, and yes, they can be comforting, and yes, they can do all those things to be a part of it. But the contentment part, that part inside of me, That ache inside of me, he's going, look, 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 I had to learn to be content. That what God has me, where God has me, when God has me, that's what he has for me. And when I step into that contentment, when I step into that place, then all of a sudden, it's great if I have, but it's also okay if I don't. It'd be awesome if I could do, but it's okay if I can't. Because there's just something that is solid. And it's learned. It's learned. Verse 12. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. By the way, this is a model that has been proven throughout all of Scripture Whenever there's true abundance, what we have found is that when there's true abundance, people walk away from God because their needs are met, therefore they don't need God. Shown over and over again. Soon Israel got in the promised land and, they, and their flocks grew and everything was great. One of the passages I still think is one of the saddest passages in all of Scripture. Judges 2.10, which says, In the next generation grew up and knew nothing about God or what he had done for them. One generation. Because again, why tell the story? We got everything we need. We don't need to worry about God. We have everything. And God just goes, wow. Then on the other stream, we have this idea that in straight poverty, then there's this anger with God. How do we find that secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need? Because again, those things are not what brings contentment. What brings contentment is where I'm at right now with God is good was good, is where I'm supposed to be. And then to fight the idea that if if I only had, 
and fight that and go, no, that's not going to do it. It's just not. I mean, yeah, for a moment. But, but in that place, how do I find that place of like, no, God, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm content. I'm good with you. And he said, again, I had to learn that. I had to learn that, again, an abundance and a need, there's these extremes. How do I know that we have this? It's interesting. There's a passage about fasting. Fasting is one of the things you can do, but there's an interesting passage that talks about the idea sometimes you just fast because you don't have food. I'm like, whoa, what? Because in that moment, what God's trying to say is, do you trust me? Do you trust me? We'll get there in a little bit. But do you trust me? In Matthew 6, Jesus speaks. By the way, one thing you gotta, one of the things you're going to have to wrestle with in your heart is either what Jesus is saying is true or it's not. And look, this is a learned process. Either what he is saying is true or it's not. Either he is lying to you or he's giving you nice platitudes or he's giving you a pipe dream that you can maybe hold on to or... What he is saying is actually true. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, and what shall we drink, and what shall we wear? Those are pretty big things. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? Why are you anxious about this? Watch this. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Listen to me. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Not once has any of my boys at the age of about five, four, five-year-olds came to me panicked and anxious over what they were going to eat the next day. Not once were they anxious about what they were going to wear. Jody had for them a you know, a closet of clothes and had a pantry of food. Not once did they just wake up with all this anxiety. Man, I wonder what we're going to eat tomorrow. I hope my mom and dad come through. Hope they really pull this off. Not once. And by the way, even into their age now, I don't think they're that worried about whether or not there's going to be food in the house. But it's amazing how as adults we can turn around going, oh, God, are you going to feed me tomorrow? Are you going to make sure I have what I need? And again, just like with my boys, I know that we had what it took to take care of them. God goes, I, your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He's not unaware. It's not like he's so busy. He goes, oh, I listen, I have been known to forget to feed my boys. I have been known to do that. Jody has many times walked in the house and said, did you feed them? Nope. They didn't ask. Am I, guys, am I writing this? And if they don't ask, when I'm hungry, I ask. Why are they just sitting there? Anyway, your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Watch this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let me give you a picture of this. My, my, my dad and I were working on a project in the backyard. And I have a tendency that once I start a project, I just want to get it done. Does that make sense? Um, some of you are really good at taking your break. Does that make sense? I don't understand breaks. Staff has learned that about me. Uh, Esteban, make sure that we order tacos, right? Just slow me down. But I remember working on this project with my dad, and my mom just walked up knowing my dad and I and just stuck a sandwich in my hand. Does that make sense? Kind of like, you're not going to stop, so just, right? And she'd walk out with glasses of lemonade and just stick it in my hand. Oh, thanks, Mom. Now, at the moment, it was incredibly refreshing and incredibly beneficial. Does that make sense? But that's not where my brain was. Let me tell you something. I want you to say, I believe that needs to be the picture of this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That needs to be my focus. And we have a God that comes in and goes, by the way, eat a sandwich. Here's a drink. It'd be good for you to get dressed tomorrow. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
Because if I'm focused on the things of his kingdom, God goes, I know how to make sure you get fed. I know how to make sure you, get, you drink. I know how to make sure that you get what you need. I'm not forgetting you. And by the way, when you will forget, I will make sure I'm there to take care of you. But we don't believe this. I got to make sure I got it stockpiled and I got all these things and, and I'm all set to go. I was listening to this guy about diets. He goes, isn't it amazing? How many of you guys have had a chocolate muffin? You know what a chocolate muffin is? Let's just call it is. How many of you guys had chocolate cake? It's cake. Don't lie to yourself. Chocolate muffin with chocolate chips in it is like the icing. It's cake. We have found a way to bring cake to breakfast. <laughs> and here's what's amazing. In the hour that I'm going to go from getting up to going to breakfast, well, I better have a muffin, which makes it sound better than cake. But I got up and had cake. And by the way, I had breakfast, but I'm going to go to lunch, but I'm on my way to see I'm at an airport. Well, I better buy a snack so I don't pass out before I get fed on the plane. <laughs> Folks, it is amazing to me how we will plan this world. The guy goes, um, I kind of know how to take care of you. But seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Again, all these things will be added to you. Watch this. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Some of you woke up this morning already worried about tomorrow. Listen to me. You woke up this morning already worried about tomorrow. And I'm telling you today has, has enough of its own junk. Amen? Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. A guy goes, Jeff, I know how to make sure you have food tomorrow, and I know how to make food the next day. If your focus truly is me, and if you're seeking me, I know how to slip a sandwich into your hand. If your focus is on the things of my hope and my, uh, my direction. And this is what Paul's talking about. He goes, he goes again. And folks, it is an amazing thing when you're in a place where all of a sudden God goes, I know what you need and I know how to do that. I've had this image and I can't, and in my head all week long of so many times that I believe there are angels with a sandwich by the way, that God's going to pay for. And a drink and clothing. And they're like walking up behind me and they're ready to bless me. And I don't trust. So I put it on the credit card. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the angel went, ah, oh, backs off. Like there's these moments that they want to come in and show God's faithfulness. And before we give them a chance... We're already anxious about it, so we just take care of it ourselves. Do we trust God in this way? Verse 13, I love this. After saying all this, he says, I can do all things through, he, through him who strengthens me. So let me tell you this story. Um, we're in the middle of college. Uh, think about call, paying, paying for college. Ben's going to go off uh, in uh, this next year. He's chosen Grand Canyon University. We now know how much it's going to cost. There it is. There's the amount. That's the scary thing. When I was going to, uh, when I was leaving for college, I didn't get scholarships uh, uh, because I wasn't good enough in school to get scholarships. Um, and I remember. Between my freshman, I mean my my senior and freshman year of college, I went up to a camp and I just said, "God, my dad's a truck driver. Uh, they weren't able to put any money aside for school. Um, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I don't want debt. And um, I'm going to a private school at the time. In 1986, it was three hundred dollars a unit. That was just crazy to me." I know you're la laugh now, but that time it was crazy to me. And I said, what, God, what are you going to do? And I went up and I was praying and fasting over this. And I said, I'm going to follow you, but I don't know how this works. 
was talking, side note, to one of the guys uh, with uh, CMA, and one of the things they're seeing happening, and just so you're aware of, is they got kids that want to go into missionary work and want to go into uh, professional work, but they're coming out of Bible college with forty and $50,000 in debt, and they can't go on the mission field until that debt's paid. And by the time that debt's paid off, they've already got themselves a family and they're into a place and they never go to the mission field. It's a real problem. So I remember going and, and um, I had to work a full-time job. I started off by being a janitor at our church and, and, and I, I remember that I would get out of class and I'd go be a janitor. I'd get off at midnight and I'd study till like two in the morning and then get, do, it, do it all over again. My church stepped up and helped out. Next thing I know, I got... Let me just say this. It took me five years because I had to take some semesters off to, to work up money to help pay for stuff. It took me five years. By the way, I got, um, uh, um, I got uh, a grant that was given me because the, um, I love this. Anytime I had money in my pocket, I would walk, I'd walk by the financial aid office and I'd just give it to the ladies and they would just put it in my account. Does that make sense? Well, they saw me do that so many times that when a grant came up that, that there were no criteria that like I had to have good grades and actually had to be good looking or anything, they gave me that grant. The financial aid office women fought for me and got me that grant. I, I, I traveled for the school. I did all these things. Folks, I graduated, listen, of five years of Bible college with $1,000 in debt that I paid off in three months and was done. Because I believe that we have a God that says, if you'll trust me and be about my kingdom, I know how to take care of you. And I got story after story after story. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And what happens is, is that we let these things get overwhelming. He goes, no, 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 no. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If God wants me to do it, if God wants me to be part of it, and I'm going to be about of his kingdom, he's got me. He's got me. But we see the waves, as Peter did when he walked out of the boat, and go, the waves are too big, this is too scary, and we sink. For five years, I kept my eyes on Jesus. And I walked out of school with no debt. I mean, literally, $1,000 is nothing. Paid for it, was done. My parents, they said, Jeff, we can pay your auto insurance. That's what we can do. And again, I just want you to know that as I think about Ben and I think about where he's going to go or what Ethan decides in the future, how do I put within them a hope of saying, trust God, he's got this. If you're going to be about him, trust God, he's got this. Doesn't mean, by the way, I had to work jobs, I worked side jobs, I worked side hustles, I did everything else I had to do. It wasn't like I just waited for him to hand me money, but I'm just telling you that we have to trust God in these ways. And this is Paul talking. Verse 14, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. I love that word, yet. He goes, look, I'm not asking a need. I'm not telling you I have a need. Yet, because he goes, look, yet you did something. That yet is powerful. He's saying this, yet you wanted to be a part of it. You wanted it to be significant. Yet. Yet. It was kind of you to, be, to share my trouble. And, and, and that's what we're talking about. How do we share? When we help the shoguns in Russia, how do we share? We send our local missionaries to go and, and, and do things around the globe. How do we share? How do we stand with them? How do we journey with them? Yet, it was kind of you to share in my, in my trouble. Verse 15. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, I'm sorry, in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Ironically, the church in Philippi, for whatever reason, had a part of its DNA that they were going to partner with Paul, that they were not going to let Paul go anywhere and be empty handed. By the way, that was not true of every church. And by the way, it's not true of every church. And the Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. 
They saw that they could be part of something bigger than themselves, outside of themselves. They saw who Paul was, that Paul brought the gospel to them in affliction, being beaten and then thrown into jail. And they go, we want to partner with you. So let me tell you about your church. Cedar Church, 10% of everything that comes here goes to missions, period, end of story. We don't pull from it. We don't draw from it. 10%, period. Of that 10%, 5% goes to C&MA because C&MA is doing missions around the world. So instead of us just being about the things that we are about, we get to be a part of a bigger pot, a bigger part of that. We were just at the district, and it hurt my heart to have our district superintendent stand up and say how sad he was that so many of the churches were not paying their 5%. And all the excuses that come with that. When we planted inroads, um, our deal that we signed on the bottom line was is that we would pay 10% of all of our offerings back to Stadia for the purpose of planting more churches for 10 years. 10 years, 10%. That's the commitment that we made. We had what I would say is a rough plant, some real issues with the organization that planted us. We dealt with those, went to those, worked those things out. And yet, come to find out, we are one of the few churches that ever fully made their 10-year commitment. I don't know why churches sign on the bottom line or pastors sign on the bottom line and then later down the road go, nope. I don't get it. Because we gave 10%, at the same time, listen to me, in that 10 years, we were also supporting a church um, that was happening in Santa Clara called Adventure. We also were supporting the Shulgans, and we also were supporting local missions here through CityServe. So we were giving more than our 10%, and let me just say, to this, say this to you, financially, Enroads never really struggled. I'm going to tell you this right now. Cedar's Church is going to keep its commitments financially to God. We're going to give our 10%. We're going to make sure our 5% goes to our district. And in May 19th, the Todds are going to come back. Rich and Christy, we're going to be talking about missions that Sunday. And I want you to know we're going to take an offering for the Great Commission Fund. And we are going to make our commitment to give that to the Great Commission Fund. Because I believe that we have a God that goes, when you share in those things, God blesses you. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I think we become short-sighted when we don't understand that we are to be a part of things, and then we think we're being judicious, or, oh, we'll keep it here, and we'll do things locally. And God goes, you're missing the picture. I want to bless you, but because you're going to hold it back, you're not going to get what you should get. And if I believe that we want Cedars to be financially secure, the first thing we do is we make sure we pay our 10%. And the second thing we do is we look for opportunities to reach out beyond our walls. I want you to understand that in the same way that churches, because this is what's being written to this church, I do believe applies to you financially. And I'm not talking the tithe. I'm not talking the 10%. Let me tell you something. 10% is a great, 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 great placeholder. For some of you, that's a goal to go for. And for some of you, 10% is something you should have passed a long time ago. Because I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus was more excited about the women who put in two copper coins than the guys who put in the big bucks. But by the way, the big bucks was loose change in their pockets. And she gave everything she had. See, what's funny is you think, oh, 10%. Oh, that's so hard. Um, If you listen to God, 10% may be something you blow by us a long time ago. It's about being at a place of trusting in him. What would it take for you to give in a way that you trust in him? If 10% is there, man, man, that's something you push for. And that's what it takes, then go there. I'm not trying to set a tithe. I'm not trying to set a number. I'm trying to set a heart that says, I want to be in a place where God has to come in 
And by the way, slip me a sandwich. Do you understand what I'm saying? I love this verse with all my heart. Not that I seek the gift. He goes, hey, thank you for giving. Not that I seek the gift. Watch this. But I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He goes, look, I'm not trying to get the gift. I'm trying to get the fruit that is going to increase to your credit. You're going to be blessed, blessed, because you gave to me. Not because I was asking for it, because you stepped into it. And he says, look, the fruit that increases to your credit. Philippians 4, 10, uh, uh, 10, I'm sorry, 4, 18. I have received full, full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Listen, they weren't supporting Paul. They were giving to God. They were a part of what was taking place. He goes, look, you think you're giving to my need. Great, I didn't have a need. I'll take it because when you give to something like this, you're giving to God. And by the way, God is faithful. You're his kids. He wants you to do well. Verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply every need. And we think we got to be in control of it. And we think we got to be able to do this. And we've got to make sure we hold back. And we got, no, he goes, why? Seek first the kingdom of God. I know how to slip you a sandwich. I do. I know how to feed you. I know how to take care of you. If you are about me and you're trusting me, trust me, I know how to take care of you. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says this, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Let me read that to you one more time. I uh, went too far. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches. And God is able to make all the grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. My God will supply every need of yours. Verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now you're going, Jeff, that's the end. There's three more verses next week. (laughs) But I want to say this to you. This is about a church that collectively got together and said, we want to be a part of what Paul's doing. And he's blessing them. And I want you to know that the church in Philippi was blessed because they gave. Blessed because they found a way. They even sent one of their very own Epaphroditus because they cared so much. Folks, God knows how to slip you a sandwich. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the things that matter. He will do phenomenal things. And I just want you to, I just want you to, by the way, this is one of the things that God says, test me in this. Try me out. And I've watched person after person test God in this and be blown away by what he does. I challenge you. I challenge you. And I challenge this church that we would be like a church in Philippi, that we are caring about the things happening outside and beyond our walls, not just what happens on this campus or in our home churches. Thank you. And God bless you. Father, let's... uh, Let us come to you with an open heart. Father, let us come to you with a desire to see what happens when we trust you in this way. Father, I know there are people right now that are just struggling. Money is such a big issue. They're so fearful. But Father, I would ask that they would have the freedom of what it means to walk in you. Walk in you. And trust you that you know and you have it set up. You already have their meal planned tomorrow. You already know what they have set for it. You have things that they could never even imagine if they would just trust you. So Father, let us be. Let us be aware. Let us be aware that you love us so. And let us be aware that we can be a part of something where then you say, I know how to meet your needs. And I give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen.